when I was first invited to give this talk on what do I mean to the marketplace, and I saw the um, preliminary program, it struck me that I was the only woman on the program. And then I had the very unholy thought of perhaps they put a woman in this spot so she could talk about her buying power in the marketplace. And I had visions of bargain sales and things like that. And then I came to realize that that's exactly what the program committee had in mind. But talking about our buying power on a supernatural level, not the buying power that comes with dollars and cents or a Bank AmeriCard. And so that's what I hope to talk about, really, in these few minutes. Each speaker that has preceded me has defined marketplace according to his thinking. And for these next few minutes, I'd like to give you my definition of marketplace. It isn't really very lofty, and it isn't really theological, but I think it will make sense to you. It's not anti-theological either. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the bumper stickers, the posters, the banners, the little things you put on your desk that say, bloom where you are planted. This, in a very brief sentence, I believe, is our marketplace, and this is what we are to do in our marketplace. We are to bloom where we are planted. I think that while this is easy to say, it's much more difficult to carry out. I believe it's what Francis would say to us if he were here today in 20th century language. He lived this, and I think this is what he asks each one of us to do, to live this. If this is our role, if we are to bloom when we are planted, where we are planted, then there are a few questions that we must ask ourselves and answer for ourselves. First of all, we must think a little bit about our self-image. We must ask, what does each one of us bring to the marketplace? And how do I use what I bring? And how do I share this and yet keep it intact and make it even more perfect? The answer to most of these questions or thoughts about most of these answers, I think, will be included in what I say. I'd like to begin with talking a little bit about my self-image. When I say I, it isn't just I, it's all the eyes I'm looking at, and you each have two. Uh, I am a child of God, and Jesus is my brother, and I'm a follower of Francis. Therefore, I'm a person of faith. Francis was a man of faith. And he was a very joyful man because he really understood his relationship with God. Francis' faith experience is at the very center, the very core of his spirituality. It was contagious, and it rubbed off on everyone around him. He knew in a very real way that nothing was of lasting importance except his relationship with God. On my own personal faith experience, I must base my self-image. God made me, and he loves me. He gave me Jesus for my brother, and he died for me. I have a place, a purpose in life. I have a role to play. I, too, must follow in the footsteps of Jesus. This spiritual security makes me free and flexible, as it did Francis. My mission in life is to share the good news of Jesus. This is my immediate goal, and through this I achieve my ultimate goal, which is to spend eternity with God. But I must be spiritually and intellectually formed to share this good news. If I'm not, I could fall to pride, as Eve did. 
I could forget my littleness, the littleness of Francis. And you know, to me it's very interesting the way God gives you opportunities to grow in littleness. And I couldn't think of anything but that this, when the morning talk was over, because I really think it's a tremendous test of humility to follow someone like Father Monte. He was really great. I could become so involved in upset priorities that I do not take time to be spiritually filled. I could fall prey to watered-down versions of the Christ life, as many present-day scholars have done. And or I could succumb to the pessimism and the negativism I see around me. I'd like to share with you a very short but true story that I heard some years ago when I was doing organizational work in, for the Confraternity of Christian Doctrine in the Midwest. A young mother told me that every Saturday afternoon when she went to confession, and you know that's a long time ago, she took her little toddler son with her. And as she stood in the confessional line, he amused himself with books that he found in the pews. On sunny afternoons, he was always fascinated by the stained glass windows in the church. His mother used to tell him about the people whose images were in these stained glass windows. St. Joseph, St. Andrew, St. Veronica, you name them. And then the little lad went to school. One day, the teacher asked her class who could tell her what a saint is. And this little lad raised his hand, and he said, a saint is someone who lets the sun shine through. This is what we should mean to the marketplace. We are to let the light of the sun shine through. And I see this as casting each one of us in two very broad roles. First of all, I believe that each one of us is sent into the marketplace to be a life-serving presence in that marketplace. Life is something positive. It implies growth. It implies change, flexibility, freedom, liberation. And I can serve life if I am open, if my attitude is one of encouragement, if I am other-oriented. It calls me to develop my powers of observation. Do I take time to see life? And what kind of vision do I have? Do I have tunnel vision? Do you know what tunnel vision is? Dim and dark and turned in on yourself. You just look straight out, and there's a little light at the end. Or do I have angle vision, which allows me to see around the corner and under the surface? And do I have imaginative vision? which permits me to see what could be and what might be. If we can combine these last two, it's very great. How good am I at identifying a problem? Or am I even aware that a problem exists? Do I know how to share without visible action? Like praying for the person in that ambulance right, rushing by. Is my perception deep enough to extend myself to others? Do I realize the importance of my own attitudes, the effects they have on others? Is my attitude toward life healthy, positive? Do I know how to help without smothering? Do I take time not only to see life, but to hear life, to listen to life, and when I listen, do I listen with understanding and appreciation? Notice I don't say with agreement, because agreement is not always possible, but understanding and appreciation are always possible. Francis returned to a literal living of the gospel. And so must I, 
return to a literal living of the gospel. In my 20th century world, if I can follow the gospel literally, I can find complete freedom. Francis did. This is why a Franciscan is approachable, why the other person feels free to talk with him. Our role in the marketplace in serving life is to communicate not ourselves, but Christ and the good news. Francis showed us how to live the gospel values literally, without worry or concern. And because I am free, I'm also flexible. And this means that I can maneuver myself and the others in my marketplace toward the light of the sun so that he can shine through. Francis taught us to recognize and accept our human limitations and to see them as a reflection of our dependency on God. One of my limitations is my ability to be in only one small spot of the marketplace at a time. This means that my marketplace is constantly changing. Even my vision at best is limited. But wherever I am, there is my marketplace. And do you ever think of your telephone as your marketplace of the moment? and how sometimes you are planted there for many, many minutes. And do you bloom when you are planted there? I realize that I am limited in time, in talents, and in capabilities. God asks my cooperation in bringing the world marketplace back to him. Christ alone is its savior, and it's not up to me to try to reverse these roles. I'm also sent into the marketplace to establish worth. The worth of the persons and the worth of the items or the products that I find in the marketplace. One criteria for the worth of a product is, do I need it? And in regard to persons in my marketplace, I must ask myself, do I need them as persons, not as the products they represent, but as persons, not for their skills, their time, but for their personhood. We are always the fruit of our society and of our culture. Today we live in a product-oriented society. As Americans, we're proud to have carved a highly sophisticated mechanized society out of a wilderness in only 201 years. Every child is raised with a do-it-yourself mentality. This tends to make us thing-oriented, self-oriented, success-oriented. If we are to establish true worth, we must be God-oriented God and other-person-oriented. Francis was an existential man. He was a practical man and a realist. He was not really a theologian, but he was a contemplative. He was a personal man. His approach was never impersonal. He had that personal touch that endeared him to everyone. Think of the story of how he ate with the hungry novice. And he ate so the hungry novice would not feel self-conscious. Prime worth is found in being. Of secondary importance is the worth that comes from doing, from achieving, from the product a person represents. But the world rarely sees it this way. Francis has called each one of us to live the gospel today in our own marketplace in a very radical manner. Perhaps one of the radical ways in which we can live this gospel is to try to establish the worth of the personhood within our own marketplace. This means that we cannot be product-oriented, but we must be person-oriented. 
It means that we take people on faith. It means that we serve them with love and sacrifice and courtesy, which is a rare commodity today. A word and a concept that is closely related to worth is gift. If I wish to establish the worth of a person, I must see myself and the other person as gifts. I am a gift. Each one of us here is a gift. I am gifted because I bear within myself the triune God. A gift is something to be given, to be shared, not kept for oneself. We are called to make every meeting with every person in our marketplace not just an encounter in the modern psychological sense of the word, but a visitation in the scriptural sense of the word. We give ourselves as gifts to those around us, and we accept others as gifts. We retain our freedom when we offer and receive this gift of self in and through Jesus Christ. We remain liberated persons we belong to no one or to no thing, only to Jesus. And so we are not enslaved, and we do not enslave anyone. God made me, as he made all creation, to give him praise. And I am called also to see myself as a living act of praise, just as all else in the world exists or lives to praise God. He made me in his image and likeness. I bear his marks on my soul through baptism into his mystical body. He gives worth without limit to my person. And when I am assured of my worth, I contribute to creation's chorus of praise and well-being. I have been commissioned to share this with every other person in the marketplace. And as I go to this marketplace, I must take some resources with me so I can really fulfill my role. I have these resources, but I must make use of them. Prayer, the Eucharist, a living, vital, active, faith dependency and relationship with Christ. The gifts of sensitivity, perception, intuition, Awareness of my stewardship, patience, sacrifice, experience in living the gospel life. These all free me from myself and open me to ask the right question, to make the right move. My poorest resources as I go to my marketplace are secondhand information, gossip, my acceptance of worldly standards, following the crowd, thinking that I am always right, a holier-than-thou attitude. Part of our Franciscan heritage is the ability to create a synthesis between our baptismal consecration and our state as lay Franciscans. But it does mean that we can be faithful to God and to man. And we can express this faithfulness in the marketplace as joy, serenity, lack of tension, and an absence of self-sensitivity. Francis once said that a man knows as much as he can do. And I'd like to illustrate that point with this story. There was a man who went to the airport to take a certain plane. He checked the schedule and he'd given himself ample time to make this plane. And yet when he reached the gate, the plane was just taking off down the runway. He looked at his watch, and it was still 15 minutes before takeoff time. So he said to the attendant at the gate, the plane left early. Oh, no, sir, responded the attendant. It's right on the minute. But how can that be? I have faith in this watch of mine. And the attendant replied, but sir, faith without good works is dead.
That is also part of our role in the marketplace. Francis made the incarnate word evident in the marketplace of his day with the force of a spiritual revival. His vision was to live Christ, the firstborn of all creatures, the Lord of the universe and the center of history. This is part of his legacy to us. Each person we meet in the marketplace can be translated into a unique message of revelation. Each person we meet in the marketplace is an unknown tongue, and each is an interpretation of that tongue. Each is a revelation of a human person and of the divine person. And there are two final questions that I would like each to ask each of us to think about a little bit when we're thinking of what do I, as a lay Franciscan, mean to the marketplace? And the questions are these. Do I give a gracious message? Uh, I'm sorry. Do I give a gracious witness of my revelation message? And do I read the message of the other person ad adequately? On the answer to these questions, we come to know the extent of our buying power in our marketplace, and we also know how well, how beautifully, and how luxuriantly we have bloomed in our marketplace. Thank you.